Today we're going to get back into um, uh, 1 Thessalonians. Last week, uh, we started this new chapter in Thessalonians. And for those of you that weren't with us, and I think it's just good sometimes to repeat yourself uh, so that you understand what we're doing. Uh, our new sermon series is on deliverance. It's called Deliverance. And the reason is, is because of verse 10, which we will go back and visit again today. It's such a good verse. Um, but I want to make sure that we understand what the Thessalonian, um, who the Thessalonian people were and why Paul was writing to them. If, if you recall, we said this, we said that Paul had spent just three Sabbaths, just three weeks in Thessalonica. He had come from Philippi, and the people of Philippi had treated him uh, horribly. They had tried to stone him, so he still had all kinds of bruises and cuts, and he got to Thessalonica. And he had good success, it says, with the uh, uh, Greek-speaking Jews, with the women, but it didn't say anything about the men. And what we find is after three weeks of preaching to the Jews that he gets thrown out of town. He, he escapes with his life. Uh, now, what happened was that he ended up in Athens, went to Berea, ended up in Corinth a few, probably about a month or two months later. Ends up in Corinth, and he's in Corinth, and finally Timothy and Silas, who were with him in Thessalonia, catch up with them in Corinth. And they said, Paul, you can't believe it. The church is alive. It's doing great. You were only there for three weeks, but people are, are coming to Christ. They're being baptized. The church is thriving. And Paul is so excited that he, he pens his first epistle. Epistle is just a word that means a letter. He writes his first letter, and he writes it to these Thessalonian Christians. And I want to revisit today, starting with verse 10, because I want to make sure that we understand the context. These are, these are brand new believers. I don't know what it was like for you. Maybe you have a story. I'd love to hear your story sometime, by the way. If you have a story about coming to the Lord, of understanding what it means to be saved later in life, because if it's later in life, we have an opportunity to really understand what I was like before. You know, Paul had that testimony. He used to be Saul. And now he's the Apostle Paul. So he has this testimony. He knows of what, he, what it was like before. And I have the same kind of testimony. My name didn't change, but I became a different person when I met Jesus Christ, when I came to know the faith. Now, what was interesting was these brand new believers in Thessalonica, these brand new believers, Paul was only there for a few weeks, but Paul taught them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to find that that's remarkable. It's remarkable because so often today you can go to church for years and not hear about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It just isn't something that we talk about. It's in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus Christ is coming again. It's in the Nicene Creed. It was part of the early church. And sometimes it's just part of our folklore. It's kind of like an understanding that Jesus is coming back again. But Paul talks about it often. So if you look on your outline, we're going to back up to the very first verse in chapter 10. Because Paul said this, he said, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, I was flipping through my Bible just this last week, and what is interesting, and somebody actually pointed it out to me, um, is that Paul wrote so much about the second coming that in 1 Thessalonians, this book that we're in, at the end of every chapter, at the end of every chapter, he mentions it. I'll just, I'll just give this. So that was, that was the end of chapter one. Now remember, these chapters were added later. But Paul, uh, 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 Paul wrote it in such a way that he speaks of it often. At the end of chapter two, Paul says, um, uh, forbidding us, uh, let me see, he says, it is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. That's verse 19. In chapter three, at the end of chapter three, in verse 13, he says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. At the end of chapter four, of course, there's a very famous verse. We'll get to it eventually. Then we who are, caught, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the end of chapter four. At the end of five, the whole chapter five is on the day of the Lord. At the end it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live with him. Therefore comfort one another and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Talking about, again, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So at the end of every single chapter, Paul is talking about this second coming. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus spoke also of his second coming. You know, 
of the Bible is actually prophecy. It's prophecy. Now, it's important to speak prop to, to understand prophecy because when we understand prophecy, we understand a couple of things. One, we understand the integrity of the Word of God. You see, only God who created all things is able to look into the future and know with exact clarity, with 100% accuracy, those things that be not as though they were. He can speak to things as if they had already happened. And when we see prophecy that has been fulfilled, it gives us great confidence that the book that we have in front of us is written by none other than the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God, and we have confidence in that. So we know that, for example, in the first coming, right, we know at Christmas time that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Well, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. He was born of a virgin. That was a prophecy in Isaiah. Uh, there's a prophecy that says, out of, out of Egypt I'll call my son. We know that the family fled to Egypt and then came out of it. All of these prophecies were fulfilled exactly as they were foretold hundreds and hundreds of years before. And only the Bible can do that. You know, this is not a Bazooka Joe comic. This is not Nostradamus, you know, some, some vague saying of some kind that can be fulfilled a number of different ways. These are exact prophecies. Again, 25% of the Bible is prophecy, and it's important for us to, uh, to understand that all of these prophecies will be fulfilled. Now, it just so happens that uh, Jesus spoke often of his second coming as well. And... This is, this is one of the things that Jesus says. This is number two in your outline. It says, Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, and the end is still to come. So Jesus says, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. Now, what's interesting is there are a number of things that Jesus talks about. Let me see if I can pull these up real quick. This is after one. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but Jesus says, do not be alarmed, do not be alarmed. You know, so often when we speak of prophecy, when we speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ, it alarms us, it, it makes us nervous. My brother-in-law, I got to see my brother-in-law when I was in Michigan, and, and Jack's a wonderful guy, he's, I love him to death. He's a, he's, a, he's a great man, great family guy and stuff like that, but certain things make him very nervous get him very alarmed. When he sees some of the things that are happening in the world, and he's a Christian as well, and he starts thinking about the Lord coming back, he gets very alarmed, he gets very nervous. And I had to tell him this verse myself. I said, Jesus says, do not be worried about these things. Do not be alarmed. They, they're going to happen, but don't be alarmed. Certain things are, are bound to happen, but, but don't be alarmed. Well, there's a lot of things that say that's gonna happen. For example, Jesus said there will be wars. There'll be violence. There'll be lawlessness, okay? Jesus says there'll be drought and famine. The Bible says to, that there will be earthquakes, earthquakes and other natural catastrophes. There'll be disease and epidemics. There'll also be what we call the super sign. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, Daniel all spoke of a time when Israel would be back in the land. After a long period of absence, Israel would come back into the land. And for those of us that are alive today, we saw this happen in 1948. 1948, on May 14th, Israel was founded in a day. Who would ever expect that? Who would have expected that Israel would be formed in a day? In 1967, during the war, the Jewish armies came and they retook the Temple Mount. For the first time in 1900 years, Israel had control of the Temple Mount. So this is a, a super sign. So some of these things we're, we're starting to see. Now what's interesting, if you take a look at number three on your, on your note line, on your, on your notes, one of the things that's interesting in the Bible, it says that there, there are signs of the time. Signs of the time. These were the signs of the time. There's going to be certain signs. But there's all of a sudden the signs of the time become the time of the signs. The time of the signs. I gave the example, you know, I just came back from my trip, and I could tell you, why don't you come with me to Michigan? For some of you that know where Michigan is, all you have to do is get an I-75 and drive for three days. It's pretty easy, just drive north, okay? But here's the thing, okay, that when you pass Toledo, you cross I-94, and now you're gonna start seeing some, some things. You're gonna start seeing the exit for University of Michigan in Arn Arbor, and you're gonna see Route 24 going off to the right. You're gonna see certain things. So you're gonna be driving for a long time, but then finally you're going to see, you're gonna be at the time of the signs. You didn't have to look for the signs before. 
All you had to do was get on 75 and keep heading north. Well, in the same way, in the same way, there's going to be a generation that will all of a sudden the signs of the time will become the time of the signs. They'll see these things happening. And this is what Jesus says, or, uh, or Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, that this very book. He says, for you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You've heard that, right? You've heard the, Lord, the, Lord, the, 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 the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But then Paul continues, and he says this, but you, brethren, you brothers, you men and women that are the time of the signs, you are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You see, there's certain signs that the believers will see. There will be a generation that will start seeing the unfolding of this Bible prophecy. The Lord will not come as a thief in the night. It won't be completely unexpected. We won't know the day or the hour, but we'll see the signs. We'll see the signs. And as the signs get closer and closer, and as they happen with more frequency, we will be that generation that will, will see that coming. Now, I realize that this still alarms some of us, right? It does. It alarms my brother, my brother-in-law my brother Jack. I mean, he's alarmed. I mean, I'd love to talk to him. He asks me questions about these things, and the more I tell him, the more alarmed he gets. <laughs> it just happens that way. So I, I, want to have an, I have an analogy for you, because you may be the same way. So I have an analogy for you, and I can't take credit for this, okay? It's actually coming from Jack Hibbs, who is a pastor out in California. I was listening to him, and he told us this analogy. I loved it. Imagine for just a moment that you're going to come to my house, and I said, why don't you come to my house? I'm going to give you something good to eat. And you say, oh, that'd be wonderful, Pastor Ken. I'll be glad to come. So you come to my house, and in front of you, I sit down and I say, here's two tablespoons of baking soda. And you look at me and say, two tablespoons of baking soda? I mean, I am alarmed. I mean, there's something wrong with you. I'm not going to eat two, baking, two tablespoons of baking soda. And I say, well, wait, I'm not done. Here's also two tablespoons of, of butter, two, two sticks of butter. I've also got three eggs that we're going to whip. I've got some vanilla. And you say, now wait a minute, I think I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You're going to be making a cake. And that's exactly right. You see, the thing is that sometimes these signs individually can get us alarmed. Okay? We see certain things. And the thing is, we don't want to be crazy Christians, okay, when all of a sudden we see there's a 7.4 earthquake in Japan. We say, oh, goody, goody, because the Lord is coming back. No, no, not at all. But we see these signs happening, and we realize that the master baker is preparing something. Just as you would have come to my house, and hopefully I didn't bake you the cake, my wife did, but somebody would have made you a cake. But it started off with baking soda and flour and vinegar, or not vinegar, <laughs> flour and, uh, and vanilla and a few things that go into a cake. But the master baker knows what they're doing and they end up making a cake. So as we go through, and the reason I backed up is because as we go th through Thessalonians, and you saw some of the verses that we're going to come to, we're going to come to some verses about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to be alarmed. We've been talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ for almost 2,000 years. However, there's going to be a generation that's going to see the time of the signs. They're going to be a, a, around us. Now, if you are interested, all of you might not be interested, if, you're in, if you are interested, um, over in the corner, when you leave, how can you hold up one of those books? We were able to secure a number of books, maybe 50, 100 books, um, that have, there's actually two books in one, but it calls, it's understanding the signs of the time. It's exactly what it's talking about. So you're welcome to take a book as you leave. If I run out of books, I'll bring some more next week. Okay, not, not, not a big deal. I've got plenty of books. But we wanted to give them to you, okay, not to alarm you, but to give you the information about what the Lord, what the Bible has to say about some of the signs of His coming. Because here's the thing, as Christians, we're supposed to be looking forward to it. It's not something that we're not looking forward to, but the Bible calls it the blessed hope. Paul says that we're to encourage each other, and even more so when you see the day approaching. Sound good? Nobody's alarmed, right? Okay, let's go on then. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I told you we'd eventually get into it. Uh, by the way, the reason that I spent some time doing this is because of these six verses are all about Paul's ministry. And Paul's going to be giving a defense of his ministry. And at the beginning, I'm sorry, 
At the beginning, what Paul's going to do is Paul's going to talk about the integrity of his message, the integrity of his message. And this is what it says. It says, Paul says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. You know, Paul's an amazing man. There's a lot of people that, that I admire, but Paul is, is right up there. I mean, Paul is just an amazing man. Not only was he this great persecutor of the church, the Pharisees of the Pharisees, but he was able to follow God completely. And he was stoned and shipwrecked and left for dead, but he continued to be a man of integrity. Now, the reason why Paul is talking about his def defense of his ministry is not because that Paul is insecure. There's nothing about Paul that is insecure. He knows exactly who, is he, who he is. He knows exactly what his message is. In fact, the Lord appeared to him and gave him the assurance of the message that Paul was going to preach. But Paul knew that if he could be discredited, if he could be silenced, or in today's language, if he could be canceled, right, and made of no effect, it would be a discredit to the gospel. Paul was excited about what was happening in Thessalonica, but he knew that he still had a number of enemies. If you remember going back to Acts 17, if you were with us, that there were people from Thessalonica that not only chased him out of Thessalonica, but then went on to Athens. And they stirred up trouble there, and then they went on from there to Berea. They, they followed Paul all the way to Corinth, stirring up trouble. So Paul had people that were attacking him. And Paul knew that if he was discredited again, that the gospel message itself would be discredited. I told you last week, and I've told you before, that what we do as pastors often is that we look at commentaries, okay? Commentaries are written by people that are much smarter than us, okay? Had more schooling, no Greek and Hebrew. They give us amazing insight, and it allows us to preach with a great amount of confidence because we read these commentaries. One of the commentaries from last century is Barclays. And Barclays is an amazing kind of mentor. He's been around for a long time. And I looked up what Barclay had to say about Paul's message to the Thessalonians in defense of his ministry. And Barclay was interesting because Barclay said, you know, if we use contemporary language, these are the charges that these people in Thessalonica had against Paul. In verse 2, it would say that Paul had a police record and therefore was untrustworthy. In verse 3, it would say that Paul was delusional. In verse 3, it would say that Paul's ministry is based on impure motives. That Paul deliberately deceived others. That Paul preaches to please others. That's verse 4. That Paul is in the ministry as a mercenary. You know what a mercenary is? A mercenary is typically referred to as a soldier, a soldier of fortune, that joins another army, not because he has any allegiance to the army, but because he's being paid. That the only reason Paul was preaching was in order to be paid. Uh, Paul only wants his personal glory or Paul is doing something as somewhat of a dictator. When Paul talks about that he has the rights of the apostle, they say, well, he's trying to lord over his authority over us. So Paul had these detractors, but Paul says this. He says, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, Paul's referencing the bruises that he had. I mean, Paul was beaten. He was flogged by a Roman soldier in Philippi before he gets to Thessalonica. So he still has those bruises. He still has all the bruising on his body. So Paul is persevering despite some tremendous hardship. He says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Paul knew that he needed to continue to speak the word of the Lord and he wanted to be able to defend his ministry, not for his sake, but for the sake of the people in Thessalonica. So let's go on. Verses 3 through 6. Paul says, For our exhortation did not come from error or in cleanliness, but, or, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words. I'm going to get back to that word flattering. As you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is our witness, nor did we seek glory from men, neither from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now, I wanted to, to focus a little bit on this word flattering, flattering words. You know, Paul was sincere. This whole section is about the sincerity of Paul's message. And I love the idea of sincerity. Uh, Barna, who is a prognosticator, he basically does a lot of surveys, 
Um, Barna did a survey going back about 15, 20 years ago, and it caught my eye because it talked about people's opinions of pastors, people's opinions of Christian pastors and what they thought of them. And it basically said, what's the difference between a good pastor and a not so good pastor? Again, very similar to what Paul was talking about. Was he honorable or was he dishonorable? Was he doing this just for money or was he being sincere? And what the responses were were interesting. It said, first of all, the number one thing that they said is that good pastors are real. They're real people. They act the same whether they're on the pulpit or you see them at home, whether with their family or they're out having lunch. It doesn't matter where they go. They're the same kind of people. They're, they're real people. They experience the same headaches, the same troubles, the trials. They're not perfect. They're just like you. They are real people. And I like that. The second thing was what Paul talks about. They were sincere. And sincere means they weren't using flattering words. That when they spoke, they said it sincerely. They meant it. So they, if they gave you a compliment, it was a genuine compliment. They were just not using flattering words. You know, so often we see that if you turn on the news today, I, I, I try to stay away from all talk radio these days. I try to stay away from the news as much as possible because I'm very dismayed by what's happening in the world. I don't know about you, but I'm very dismayed by what's happening in the world because I find I really can't trust much of anything that I hear on the news anymore. I mean, I haven't for a long time anyway, but it seems like especially today, I can't trust what I hear because I think they're just trying to flatter me. They're using whatever's convenient words that come out of their mouth in order to appeal to the crowd that's in front of them. And we kind of expect that from our politicians. You know, we really do. But we don't expect it from the news media. We don't expect it from our local authorities. And we don't expect it from health authorities as well. But it seems like all too often they're telling us just what they, we want to hear. They're using flattering words. The third thing they said about good pastors is that they were genuine. They were the real McCoy, right? They were the genuine article. They walked the talk. They didn't just talk the talk. They walked the talk. They were who they said they were, who they said that you should be. Now, what's interesting in this survey, they went one step further because then they asked not just Christians, but the rest of the people, what makes a good Christian? What's the difference between a good Christian and a bad Christian? And you can imagine the thing that came up. It came up the same type of thing, that they were real, they were sincere, they didn't use, didn't use flattering words, that they were genuine, they were the real McCoy. But the number one thing they said, you can imagine, is the word hypocrite. All too often, the church is charged with the word hypocrisy. Now, the word hypocrisy comes from a Greek word that has to do with a play with the mask that you put on. The whole idea of a hypocrite is that you wear a mask. You're hiding your true identity. You're saying something, but you're doing something completely different. You're a hypocrite. You do the very things that you're not supposed to do. And again, we see that we imagine, we can see this from our politicians, but we don't expect to see it from Christians, from real people. We don't expect to see it from our pastors as well. We don't want to be hypocrites. So this is why Paul is talking about how it's important for him to defend his ministry because he knew that the chink in his armor, the chink in his armor, is that, that some of these words, some of these dangerous words, some of these attackers, people that were saying things about his ministry, if, if, if he didn't defend himself, if they said enough, people would start believing what the others said rather than what Paul said. This is one of the reasons that he wrote to the people in Thessalonica. One of the um, authors that I love to read, he's been around for a long time, <clears throat> his name is C.S. Lewis. You know C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis wrote Divine Comment, uh, Div Divine... Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity. What was the Divine, what was the Divine something? Um, Screw Tape Letters, uh, Chronicles of Narnia. There's a number of different things that uh, C.S. Lewis wrote. And the thing I liked about C.S. Lewis is he was able to see things that the rest of us might not see. I love when people point things out that I would normally miss. And C.S. Lewis was able to do that. C.S. Lewis was able to point things out that were so apparent to him that sometimes we would miss. And one of the things that C.S. Lewis said, and I'm going to close with this, C.S. Lewis said that Christianity, Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. Right? Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. In fact, Paul said, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we should be pitied. We should be pitied. If Christianity is false, it's of no importance. But C.S. Lewis went on. He said, if it's true, it's of infinite importance. 
It's the most important thing that you've ever heard. It's the most important thing, any most important truth that you've ever discovered. I remember what it was like for myself when I first started to follow the Lord, when I first understood that what the gospel was saying was that I was, could be free from my sin, that all my sins could be paid for by Jesus Christ, that I was set free from the law of sin and death. I could be a new creation in Christ. It was so exciting for me. I was all full of zeal and I would tell a lot of people. Now, I wasn't very good at it. I only knew a couple scripture verses and I kept on repeating the same verses over and over again. I had lots of zeal but not a lot of knowledge. But that goes to what C.S. Lewis said because if Christianity is true, it's of infinite importance. It's the most important thing, the most important truth you've ever heard. There's nothing else more important than that. C.S. Lewis continues. He says, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Let me give you a, that's good. He says, Christianity of false is of no importance. If it's true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Moderately important means that you take it in, but you really don't tell anybody. You take it in, it changes your life, but it doesn't change your lifestyle. You take it in, you experience what God has for you, your sins are forgiven, but you don't act any differently than anybody else. You can go through life and people will only find out when you're dead that you were a Christian because you're having a Christian burial, you're having a Christian funeral. I didn't know, I didn't know that she was a Christian. I didn't know that he was a Christian. He's my neighbor. I didn't know that he was a, a Christian at all. You see, that's what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis says that if it's false, it doesn't matter. If it's true, it's infinitely important. The only thing it can't be is somewhere in between. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. You can't just become a Christian on Sunday. Even if you're not a hypocrite the rest of the week, you're acting like a hypocrite because it's supposed to be infinitely important. You see, if you're a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you understand this, you're real. You're the real McCoy. You're sincere in your beliefs and you're genuine in your relationship with God and with your, your fellow men as well. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the word of God. We thank you for this. Episode.